All right. Yes. So the, the first um, section we're gonna start with this morning uh, has to do with exploratory data analysis. So we've all heard from each other that we're all working on a variety of different assay types um, for, our, for our studies. But the thing they have in common is that you do a lot of measures per sample. You know, when you do transcriptomics, you've got 20,000 measures per sample, mass batch, similarly, I don't know what is the average number, maybe thousands of measures per sample and so forth, right? And then you get your data tables. Your data tables, you've got this one table with sort of thousands of measures of a sample and then X samples. And then you've got the second table of what we call metadata, this information about your sample, right? Case control, age, sex, all that stuff. So, uh, and then you have these workflows you wanna do. Um, I wanna tell, you know, what genes are differentially expressed, what proteins are differentially expressed, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you need to first understand um, some basic things about your data, which could include biological factors influencing your data, but also technical factors. And exploratory data analysis is sort of the first step in data analysis, and that's gonna help you do that, right? So the things we're gonna talk about this morning are very foundational to all kinds of data analysis. And everybody should be going through EDA, exploratory data analysis, before you throw yourself into your um, you know, task of interest. So learning objectives. By the end of this lecture, you will know the basic terminology for terms in a statistical model. Don't let your eyes glaze over. We're gonna go through it conceptually. You need to conceptually understand what's going on, okay? You will know how to perform systematic exploratory data analysis, not just kind of do a bit of this, a bit of that. So maybe a systematic checklist of how do you explore your data to identify sources of wanted and unwanted variation in your data. You will appreciate the value of exploring missingness in your data, right? Um, you will have a high level understanding of clustering and be able to cluster your data, okay? So let's take an example of a study there, right? Uh, just, for, just for sort of illustration purposes. Say our goal is to find transcriptomic biomarkers of a disease. You have a simple design, A versus B, case versus control. You have done some kind of omic assay like transcriptomics, and you wanna know what genes are different between the two conditions, okay? That's your goal. So, what you're going to do is you're going to do your differential expression analysis. It's going to give you a list of genes. These are different. What's happening under the hood? Under the hood, each of those genes is being fitted by a statistical model. Okay. We are saying, can you see my cursor? Great. We are saying the expression of the gene is affected by disease state, whether you have disease state or not, right? It could be like yes or no. Um, and then there are some additional terms. So let's just break this down. What's going on here, right? I think it's important to know a bit of this terminology because when you encounter um, you know, workflows, you don't wanna just be blindly applying something to your data. And sometimes you might encounter this terminology and then at least now you know what it is, right? So here, this is technically called in stats, your response variable. This is the output you're looking at, the measure you're looking at. Then you have a factor that you think you hypothesize explains this response variable. That's called the explanatory variable, okay? And then you have unmodeled variation, right? That could be everything that your model didn't take into account. It could be a lot. And then you have this um, beta zero term, right? Which I'll talk a bit about. So another, another sort of set of terms is that is your dependent variable. Uh, your expression is your dependent variable variable and your disease is your independent variable, right? Why do you call the expression the dependent variable? Because it depends on disease state or other factors. And just, you know, just so you know what the words are for these, these in a model are called coefficients, beta zero, beta one, they are the weights, okay? Um, for, uh, for your uh, terms. And th that extra offset is called an intercept. Okay, so there you go. This is the basic model we're trying to fit when we do our omic analysis 
and we've got 20,000 measures or however many measures, and we're gonna do it one by one for all of them, okay? So what are some other sources of variation that could be affecting your outcome, okay? We've already talked about disease or whatever, our condition of interest that we're interested in. What are some other biological sources of variation? What else could be dictating your transcriptomic output? Just give me some age, sure. Sex, that's a big one, yeah. Yes, that's a technical source of outcome, right? Um, a variation. What else? Sorry. If ethnicities, that's a big one. If you're doing human studies, right? Population stratification. I don't know if you geneticists have heard this. So yeah, there's basically two broad sources of variation in your data. Biological, it could be disease, which you want, sex, age, ethnicity, cell type composition, right? So if you're taking a bulk tissue um, and you're studying the brain, some of them might have more neurons, some of them might have less neurons just because of tissue mixtures. Technical sources of variation. Somebody was in a bad mood on Monday when they processed the data. It's going to show up in your data. Technical sources of variation are a huge source of variation in your data. Batch effects. How many of you have heard of batch effects, right? They are a, a huge sort of confounder. And then reagents. So if you switch your antibodies or whatever, uh, you, you switch some core reagents, suddenly that affects your outcome, right? So bottom line, we would love our models to be as simple as expression is expressed, you know, is explained by disease. But the reality of conducting a study is these are your sources of variation. These are in your data. These are going to affect your output unless you identify and remove them. Okay. There's also sources of variation you don't even know exist. There are things you know and there are things you don't know that are in there. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about in this course some tool to help you visualize and quantify some of these sources of variation. This includes clustering, which we're talking about this morning, dimensionality reduction, which Chaitra is gonna talk about this afternoon. At the end of this process, you will have identified sources of variation in your data. And now your model looks a little more enlightened and it says, okay, expression is a function of disease, but also needs to take into account age, sex, batch effect, and then whatever's left over residual. Okay, so that's our final model. Um, a small note in stats, that residual term, they always say it's drawn from a random distribution. I just wanna make a note that in stats, when they say random, they don't use it the way we do in common English. We don't mean arbitrary. It means it is statistic, it's sampled from a distribution that follows a particular um, well, distribution, I guess. So it's not arbitrary, right? The stats, people, random, they mean something different. So these are explanatory variables. Part of these are biological, part of these are technical, random variation. Okay. Missingness. This is a big one. You get a big table of data, and then you just say, oh, I just found this piece of code that's going to do differential expression analysis or whatever I want to do with my mass spec data. Should you just throw it into that, you know, pipeline? No, because some of your data could be missing. What's missing? Maybe your collaborator will tell you, oh yeah, some of these samples of QC didn't work. But there's also things that nobody might know is missing. So you have to look. Clinical data could be in incomplete. If you're doing a cohort study, some participants could be missing a layer of data. Some measures just don't pass QC. Okay. So, you do the missingness visualization, and there are ways to do this in R. Now, what do you do about your missing data, right? One thing you could do is you could just exclude some samples. So if somebody is missing more than 80% of their data, you just exclude it. If a patient is missing outcome, survival outcome data, and that is your core phenotype that you're studying, you've got to take that data sample out. But you don't, you make the decision. You don't let the software decide for you what's what to take out there's another technique called imputation um but you should just be aware that it exists and it allows you to guess at the missing values so there are different techniques like it's going to look for samples that are similar to your sample and make a guess about what the missing data are but even there you have to use it with caution 
you don't want to be imputing survival data if that's the main thing you're going to study, right? But maybe there are some more benign variables that it's okay to impute. I had a statistician colleague. He was very um, he was very touchy about removing samples, excluding samples, because you're going to bias your study, you know, by taking samples out. It's going to change your results. So proceed with caution, right? Use a field convention. And think about what the trade-offs are in, in sort of each situation. So here is an example of uh, structured missingness. So here is a table of data. And the way it's been visualized is if there is a missing value, there is a white, um, there is sort of a white cell in the table. So you can see it looks kind of stripy. That's because there are a lot of measures in this table. And in this case, this is what we call structured missingness. So if you've got uh, samples on the uh, x-axis, so going across, and genes on the y-axis going down, it looks like there's one patient that's missing a lot of data, right? Um, so then you want to be, you, you know, then you have to make an appropriate call about what's happening. But the point is, you have to check for missingness. They can come in different forms. And what you decide depends on what the missingness looks like in your particular study. Okay, so, so that's structured missingness. This is unstructured missingness, right? There's a few numbers missing here and there, right? So there are going to be some methods which, if they if you give them any missing values, they throw an error, and the missing value in R is usually an NA value, and there is a function NA dot omit. Any dot omit, it just means get 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 rid of any rows with empty empty values. But you have to know, and we're going to do some exercises in class to kind of look at missing data. And then there's bias unstructured missingness. So you might see something like this, where you know maybe there are two assays that were concatenated, right? And one set of patients is missing a whole layer of data. So then you might want to do two different types of analysis. Oh, what if we you know, only take the patients that have all the data and do the analysis. And then what if we separately just take the patients that, what if we use just the assay that everybody has the data for? So that kind of thing. So the goals of exploratory data analysis are to identify the magnitude size of known biological and technical variation, to identify sources of unknown variation, to find outlier samples. Why are they outlier? Mix up, maybe sample mix up. It's very common, right? Or something went wrong with the processing. Um, or there's a duplicate sample. Uh, characterize missingness. So, you know, here we've got this little table. It sort of has the different goals of uh, exploratory data analysis. What are the methods you use um, to quantify this uh, and, and kind of get a, get a handle on if it exists and you should do something about it. And then what, what do you do about it, right? So if you find sources of, if you find a batch effect, you add a batch effect term to your model. And if you have tools that do differential expression analysis, they allow you to build in additional terms. So edge R, for example, is a very common tool used for a differential gene expression. Um, and it allows you to add those terms to your uh, model. But in order to find out which terms to add, you have to go through this exercise. Identify unknown sources of variation. There's a very cool R package called surrogate value analysis. And if you run it on your program and you say, I already know about age, sex, and batches, because we generated this data on two, two batches. Um, but I want you to tell me if there's any other major source of variation. It'll say, yeah, there's two more sources of major variation I found. And it'll kind of give it to you as a vector, and then you can put it in your model. So it's a cool little tool. Detect outlier samples. You cluster your samples. And, you know, there's a sample that's kind of sitting out in the corner, which you can quantify as well. And then you might want to exclude samples for analysis, but proceed with caution. Finally, characterize missingness. Block it. In informatics, when you have this sort of table and you're presented with all these software tools, it's very tempting to just kind of throw your tool into a pipeline and 
and get a table of results because that's what that's what you want to know, right? You want to know the genes. Um, but I'm going to say again and again, you really have to learn to look at your data. You have to look at your data because you're going to see patterns that the very narrowly defined statistical model is not going to pick up on, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So you have to look at your data. Those of you who went to intro to R, you did some GG plot. Is that right? We're going to do a little bit of GG plot in um, tomorrow morning's lab as well. So GG plot is very useful. Absolutely focus on learning how to look at your data, plot simple things and so forth. So um, here's a little checklist for you for exploratory data analysis. As mentioned, you get two tables as input. One is the assay that you're measuring, gene expression. And this is like, a, I call it a skinny to long table because you have lots of measures and very few samples. I have three cases and three controls and I have 20,000 genes in them, right? So it's a long skinny table. And then there's sample information, the metadata about it, which is more of a square table, okay? Um, um, so what do you do? First, you read in the files and you see how many variables do I have? How many samples do I have, right? And in fact, when I go through my analysis code and a number of us do, we keep an eye on what the analysis is doing to our tables. You remove missing samples, you do another check. How many genes do I have left now? I only have two genes left. Oh, maybe there's a bug in my code. So that bookkeeping, I wanna emphasize, goes hand in hand with data analysis, right? It isn't just about taking your data and throwing it through a pipeline. You have to look at your data and you have to be vigilant with bookkeeping of sample sizes and stuff like that. Okay, how many measures in the metadata? How many samples are in my table? Um, let me look at the breakdown of case versus control. Let me look at the distribution of age. Let me look at the distribution of sex. You have to know your data, okay? And is there missingness? There's gonna be a little bit of R code we're gonna share in the lab, I think tomorrow, that will plot that kind of black and white table for you. So you can like use it for your code, uh, your data. Is there missingness? Decide on a solution. Then you look at the correlation structure of the data, okay? Does the data have natural groupings? If you're studying brain versus lung, the brain samples are all gonna be very similar to each other because they have shared cellular programs, right? And gene expression pro programs. That's gonna be reflected in them clustering together, right? So the core of this is correlation. And it's gonna be apart from the liver samples or whatever I said the other tissue was. Um, how many major sources of variation are there? Okay, do they map to biological or technical variables? Are there batch effects? Are there unmodeled sources of variation? And then you decide based on whether it's a nuisance variable, whether you want to try to remove it or you want to try to model it in. Okay. So here are what you can do for these, right? So how many measures are in your data, et cetera? There are these R commands, dim. Did you guys do this in intro to R? Dim is like, show me the rows and columns. Head means just show me the first few rows. Summary means show me the distribution, um, you know, um, and then plots, yeah. And then count NA, count the number of NA values, visualize them, you know. Um, then correlation structure, you do some clustering and visualization. Sources of variation, we do dimensionality reduction, which basically says, I have 20,000 measures, but they're mostly two or three major sources of variation in this data. 80% of the variation is coming from a batch effect. It happens. And then you take it out and then you can see the biological state. And um, yeah, and then unmodeled source of variation, I talked about surrogate var variable analysis, and then you're ready to do your whatever differential um, expression analysis and so forth. And for that, you use your linear models. Okay, so a bit about clustering. The purpose of clustering is to find groups in your data, right? Why do you wanna find groups in your data? You might wanna find batch effects. You might wanna find, if you do like in cancer and disease studies, you're always asking how many types of, of brain cancer are there? How many types of medulloblastoma are there? That kind of thing, patient subtypes. 
You want to find what gene expression programs define a cell state, what defines disease state. So you want to find groups of co-expressed genes, okay? And you guys might have seen heat maps like this in publications, right? Where it's saying we've got three samples here, three samples here. They group in these two ways. And, you know, these genes are up over here in this group and those genes are down and so forth. Applications of clustering, right? So you might, a big one in biomedical research is taking, you know, patient data for disease omics maps and saying how many subgroups do we have, right? So this is an example of uh, an aggressive brain cancer called glioblastoma and how they first discovered multiple subtypes in it. You might do single cell genomics where you've taken your tissue of interest and you're saying, what are all the intra, what are all the um, cellular populations that we've got in here? And then you're like, the one we want to study is the immune population, right? So clustering is used to identify sets of cells that go together. The heart of clustering is you've got two samples and you need to find the distance between those two samples, okay? So you need a way to quantify how similar or dissimilar two samples are. So you can put the similar ones together and put a big circle around them, computationally speaking, and say, this is a cluster. So that quantity is your distance metric. Yeah. Different types of data require different distance metrics. Do you guys know any examples of distance metrics? Like from high school, maybe geometry. We have two data points, you want a distance. Euclidean, that's right. So that's an example of a distance metric. I was hoping somebody would say Euclidean. <laughs> so different distance metrics have different formulae which means they take different things into account for the data. So what's appropriate for one application may not be appropriate for a different application. That's what you need to know, right? So Euclidean, everybody's, everybody learns about this in school. It's straightforward. This is, the, this is the formula for it. It's just the distance and coordinate space, okay? Root squared error. But Euclidean distance ignores correlation between the variables. Right. So if you know that the data are uncorrelated, you can use Euclidean um, measures. What do I mean by data are correlated or uncorrelated? So that means that so in this in this view, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, right? So does knowing something about X tell you something about Y? That's what conceptually correlated means, right? If X is higher, is Y also higher? right? Um, in this left-hand side, no, it's not correlated. It's like a perfect circle, right? Knowing X doesn't tell you anything. On the, on the right-hand side, yes, they are correlated. As X increases, Y increases, okay? And uh, so you would use something like the Mahalanobis distance. I need to learn how to pronounce that. Mahalanobis distance, um, which takes into account if variables are correlated. So if you look at that formula over there, you've got a little S with a super square of S to the minus one. That takes into account the covariation between the two variables. All you need to know is distance metrics are different for different data types. And if the variables are correlated, use the Mahalanobis distance. There's a related term, similarity. That is more loosely defined, like Pearson correlation, right? If, if you apply Pearson correlation between two data sets, high correlation, they're similar. So another one is Manhattan distance or block distance. So if you've got those two data points, which are those black circles, the block distance between them is, uh, you know, um, is sort of the, the red line that goes at the top there. Um, and this tends to use in some machine learning application. Just be aware there are different distance types. Hamming distance. Hamming distance is if you've got binary data. If you've got binary data, you just count what are the number of mismatches between them. That's the distance between the two sets of data, uh, two vectors. Common clustering approaches, hierarchical clustering. This is a very common one that we see in the genomics, uh, in genomics data. Uh, what hierarchical clustering does is it successively groups nearby samples that are similar to each other, and it builds up a tree of similarity. K-means clustering is uh, a different type of clustering. We'll talk about that. And there are sort of other approaches as well. 
So in hierarchical clustering, you, you build a dendrogram, right? You've seen the, the heat map that I put up. So you build a dendrogram. Um, and what the dendrogram, how you build it, I'll tell you in the next slide. But once you've built a dendrogram, then you decide on a cut point in that dendrogram to say, um, these two major branches, I'm gonna call them the two different clusters. So you have to cut the tree of the dendrogram at a certain point, and that's how you get your two different clusters. Okay. Um, so for example, how do you build your tree? Here's an example with uh, six samples. And then you say, using my distance metric, you know, I think A and B are the closest, and I think D and E are the closest. Um, and then I, I sort of put A and B together, and then I say, what's the sample that's the nearest to A and B? Okay, it's C. So then we kind of add a branch between A, B, and C now. Um, and then similarly, we say, what's the sample that's closest to D and E? It's F. So now we make a branch between D, E, and F. And now we end up with these two sub branches, one of which has ABC, the other of which has DEF. So it builds it up, it builds it from the gr ground up. So the other term for this is agglomerative, which is a mouthful. All right. And then finally, you say now that we have these two subclusters, this blue subcluster and this green subcluster, we're going to connect them together. And that becomes sort of the top branch of the tree. So that's one way of clustering. K-means clustering, you have to decide beforehand. Sorry, you have a question? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 it could be the A and B is a vector of values. It would be the gene expression profile for a sample. So you're clustering samples. So, so when we say high dimensional space and dimensionality reduction, it sounds a bit like Star Trek, but it just really means you have a lot of measures in your data. So if you do a gene expression study, you have 20,000 measures in your data, that's 20,000 dimensional space, okay? So what you're doing is, and that, that, that set of numbers is called a vector, okay? So the expression profile for a sample is a vector, and then if you want to cluster your samples, you use a distance metric to say the gene expression profile for sample A and the gene expression profile for sample B, I'm going to compute a distance between them. And if those two are closest, I'm going to draw a little branch between them. Right? They are simple, they should that's uh, Yeah, that's that uh, gene expression profile. Yeah, based on the overall data. You guys have any other questions at this point? There are a few options that um, that work out of the box for um, hierarchical clustering. It can be whatever you want, but there are some that in practice that the field has found that works well. So, the questions? K-means is different. K-means clustering is I looked at my data or I know something about the biology of it and I have a sense that I expect four clusters or five clusters. I just need the algorithm to like bucket my samples and say these samples are all in cluster one, those samples are all in cluster two, right? So for example, if I'm doing a tumor study and I have three types of tumors, I know there are three types of tumors. I got the gene expression profile. I'm going to tell the algorithm, just cluster the samples three ways. I know there should be roughly three clusters in here. So then here, your K would be three, right, in this example. And then um, what, what the way this works is that your uh, the algorithm puts your, it plots your data, basically internally it represents your data. And then it's, it says, my goal is to find the, the sort of cluster centers that separate the samples out maximally, right? So I'm just gonna go out to this animation here, okay? So this animation is showing you how the computer arrives at three clusters to group your data in, 
So the way it works is it randomly assigns three points as let's start here. These are my three clusters, okay? Um, and then what it does is it, uh, it takes each sample in your mix and it assigns it to its, what I call the cluster center, okay? And then based on that, it, at the end of that, you get a bunch of samples assigned to pseudo cluster one, bunch of samples assigned to pseudo cluster two, bunch of samples assigned to pseudo cluster three. Then now that it's made the assignment, it computes the center of the new clusters based on that assignment. And what that's gonna do is that's going to shift where the center was. So the first guess the computer made was just kind of, it had to start somewhere. So it's called initialization was kind of, um, you know, you can think of it as random. <laughs> And then it assigns the samples to those clusters. And now that it's found these clusters, it says, okay, now that I've grouped the samples, what is my new cluster center? So then it, it makes that the new cluster centers. And then it repeats this process. It reassigns samples to its three buckets. And then that kind of shifts the clusters a bit more. And it keeps doing it until the cluster centers stop moving. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's got a rule for, um, you know, for, it has a, it has a, a rule that it, once the centers stop moving by a certain cutoff, you know, and that cutoff, you might be able to parameterize. You may be able to parameterize a number of iterations, but you know, when you're starting out, it's good to just keep the defaults because they were selected reasonably with these software tools. But it's it's just a good to know a bit under the hood what's happening. So if you don't wanna know under the hood what's happening, all you have to know is if you have a sense of roughly how many clusters to expect, then you can just say, I know to expect three clusters. K means give me three clusters. And it's going to go through this movement. Uh, it's gonna go through this process and it's gonna assign your samples to three clusters, right? Um, but then you might say, you know what? I'm looking at the data now and I think it's four clusters, right? Um, and then you can say run k-means with four. And then we're gonna have a way of assigning this of fit of the cluster. So we're gonna talk about that. How do you measure if clustering assignments are good? But this is a very popular method, whoops. Um, just like distance metrics, uh, there are multiple distance metrics to be used for different applications. There are multi multiple clustering uh, approaches to be used for different kinds of data. Sorry, did you have a question? So what you would do in practice is you would run it for a number of different values, unless for sure in your study design, you want to separate it two ways or three ways, right? But what you would do in practice and what we'll do in the lab exercise is that you, you, do, um, you assign clusters for different values of K and for each of them, you measure how well it fits the data. And then you say, this is the best fit for the data, right? So, yeah. Um, so this is just to say that there are other types of clustering that might be valuable for other unique forms of data. So in this example, um, you know, you've got this kind of spiral data structure. And K means, because it measures sort of the nearest distance and uh, you know, using Euclidean distance or whatever, it may not notice that there is continuity uh, between these samples. It's going to say this is one half and that's one half. But then you have other sort of methods such as these graph, graph representation methods, just spectral clustering, which are going to find the nearest neighbor in a graph community kind of sets. So, so just be aware there are different types of clustering methods for different types of data. In practice, what you would do is, um, if you're not sure about the kind of clustering to use for your data, you wanna refer to people who have published something very similar to look at the workflow and get a sense of the best practices in your field. 
how do you decide on how many clusters, right? One could be you cut the dendrogram by I. You're like, I think it's, I think it looks like we've got, you know, three clusters here. And then there are some metrics of clustering. Okay. So we're going to cut the dendrogram. We're going to do all this in class. Um, there's a package, our package called CL Valid. We're going to use that in class as well. You're going to load your data and then you're going to use K means and you're going to say, try it for a few different values of K and tell me which one seems to fit the data the best. One measure of uh, clustering goodness of fit is called the silhouette statistic. This is very commonly used. Um, basically, for each uh, data point, they measure uh, how close a sample is to all the samples in its cluster compared to samples in the nearest cluster, okay? So it requires identified clusters. So, you know, the silhouette statistic of a data point is its average distance to samples in the next cluster over compared to its distance in samples in its own cluster. Remember the clusters are defined by us, right? So we are trying to get at the truth of what is the sort of structure of the data. Um, this metric gives you a value between minus one and one. One plus one means there's really good separations like highlands, right? Uh, that means everybody is closest to their cluster uh, members, members is the term, compared to the nearby clusters. This is an example of a silhouette plot. So um, you've got samples in different clusters here, one, two, and three, and you've got the silhouette statistic plotted, okay? And they've kind of... Um, ordered the samples so that in a given subtype, you start out with a sample that has the best silhouette statistic and it goes down, okay? What I want you to notice is that in subtype two and three, these are positive silhouette statistics, but in subtype one, you have some samples that are positive and some that are negative. So that might be a sign that the clustering isn't working as well with these particular samples. They might be better assigned to a different cluster. So again, to visualize is a different way. If you have a data set here, you've got four different clusters in this data set, right? Each of these is a data point. Here is your centroid. It just basically means, you can think of it as the average, right? We think of a, what is the average of a set of values? It's the mean, right, of this. What is the average when you have X and Y? It's the mean of X and it's the mean of Y and you plot it on that graph, right? What's the average of 20,000 dimensional space? It's the average of dimension one, average of dimension two, average of dimension three. So it's a vector of 20,000 numbers, each of which is the average of the corresponding gene. It's the same thing. It's just a lot more numbers. Like, you know what I mean? So if you have 20,000 genes, you have the average for each of them. That is the centroid of your cluster. It's basically, if you had to say, where's the center of my cluster? That's where it is, okay? So you got your data points here. Uh, and then you have the centroid of these clusters. And using in this method, they've come up with four clusters. So if you want to compute the silhouette statistic of this data point, you compare its average distance to all the samples in its cluster compared to its average distance to all the samples. There should be more arrows in B there because you're gonna be comparing it to everything in the neighboring cluster, okay? And then there's silhouette statistic as one measure. There are multiple measures of cluster goodness of fit. One, another example is Dunn index. You just need to know this is what it is, you know? Dunn index also measures something very similar, distance between the sample and its own group or group assignment compared to the other group assignment. And this value goes between zero and infinity. So different measures have different scales, okay? You wanna maximize this. Okay. And there is a third one, connectivity. Why are we telling you about these metrics? Because in the, in the lab, we're gonna be using uh, this R package called CL valid. And when you do your clustering, it's going to give you these three measures for the goodness of fit. So you should just like, this is what it is. Um, and this is just another way of measuring connectivity, but this is a different one because you want this to be as minimal as possible, okay? Just counts what fractions of nearest neighbors are not in your cluster, right? 
So what if you are in a perfect cluster, then your nearest neighbors should all be in your uh, should all be in your cluster. The fraction of nearest neighbors not in the cluster should be zero. Does that make sense? Okay, a few nodding heads. Fine. So, what is the point of clustering? The recap: the point of clustering is to find groups in your data. How do you find groups in your data? You have different data point samples on which you measure gene expression data. You need to find a way to measure the distance between those samples. We talked about some distance metrics, Euclidean, Manhattan, et cetera. Then you have clustering, right? Which uses that distance metric to start grouping your samples, okay? Uh, mul multiple clustering methods exist. Most commonly in omics, we use hierarchical clustering and k-means clustering. There are ways to measure the goodness of your clustering solution. These include silhouette, done, and connectivity. Okay. So to recap, um, this morning we talked about exploratory data analysis. Uh, exploratory data analysis is the first thing you should be doing when you get data from anybody because you are going to find surprises in your data. Okay. So the goals are to identify major sources of variation, missingness, and outlier samples. Why? So you can decide whether you need to build them into your model. Because if you don't tell the model, there's a major source of men versus, you know, the major source of variation is men versus women. And you tell your model, oh, I only want you to find disease effect. It's going to find some kind of diluted effect of disease and sex mixed together. So you need to tell your model, there is a sex effect, there is a batch effect, okay? What if you profiled more case samples in your second batch? It might pick up the batch effect, right? So, yeah. Um, in a nutshell, um, there's our package called SVA, Stargate Variable Analysis. And they have, um, they have a nice like, vignette, which is in sort of a worked example. You give it your, you give it your data, you tell it, uh, this is the model. I, these are the sources of variation I know about. I know about age, I know about sex, I know about batch, right? And it'll report to you, I have found two more sources of data, of variation in your data, and it'll give you the vector of, you know, that you need to be including in your model for that, right? And then in your final model, when you do your gene expression analysis, you put age, sex, batch, and the two output vectors it gave you. So, um, yeah, so let me finish my recap. So, again, so that's the point of exploratory data analysis. It is really basic, but it's often glossed over because we think of the more glamorous things we want to do, right? Um, there is a systematic way to do it. There's a checklist in these lecture slides. You can print them out and kind of like put it on your desk wall and, and you know, the one which has all those R commands on it. And then you can write up a piece of code that does it this way, and then you save it. And then the time you come back, you can reuse your piece of code. Clustering we talked about helps you find natural groupings in your data. It requires a distance metrics. Oftentimes when you use packages in R, they will have a default distance metric for you. Um, and um, yeah, and then clustering can be validated by metrics. Clustering is what the, you know, it's a way of describing the data. It hopefully is related to the biology of what you want to study, right? But if you haven't taken care of batch effects and stuff, your clusters might reflect not what you think they do. So it's just an assignment. It's a group assignment for convenience and grouping things to study. All right. So let's take a break, I think, right, Mia? And then we can come back and do some EDA and clustering in R. Live R coding. <laughs> 